Welcome back and we're trying to get you a 360 degree view of the reopening, whether it be with macro data, what industry is saying and also of course what the uh, uh, stats are saying on the medical front. Professor Vidya Sagar is joining us, Distinguished Professor at uh, IIT Hyderabad and a Fellow of the Royal Society. Great to have you with us. Um, Professor Vidya Sagar, now you have been working on a very unique model called a Sutra, uh, which is a new approach to really uh, tracking the uh, journey of the pandemic across India or the progress of the pandemic and the number of cases. If you could share a little bit more about that with us and really what it's indicating now that it seems that things are improving and we're gradually reopening. Yeah, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, at the outset, I would like to clarify that, uh, <coughs> pardon me, Sutra is the joint work of three people, uh, Professor Manindra Agrawal from IIT Kanpur, uh, Lieutenant General Madhuri Kanitka, who is with the Office of the Chief of Defense Staff and myself. So Sutra stands for, uh, the acronym is, S is for uh, susceptible, U is for undetected, T is for tested positive, R is for remote, and A is for analysis. So the novel feature of the coronavirus is the presence of a very large number of asymptomatic patients. So these asymptomatic patients, they don't really show any external signs of infection, but they still go around infecting others. Uh, so any part of controlling the pandemic has to give some, has to include some method of estimating how many asymptomatic patients there are. You can't really find every single asymptomatic patient because there are too many of them. But if you want to project the course of the pandemic, uh, you at least need a reliable estimate of what fraction of the people are asymptomatic. And ours is really one of the first models to to do that. Uh, and the second uh, unique feature of our model is that. Uh, it's purely data driven. So we take the uh, available data, that is the number of daily reported uh, infections, recoveries, deaths, and use those to estimate the parameters. So that's about the model. Uh, in terms of the predictions, what we have shown is that the number of um, infections would peak during the first week of May that is the seven day moving average. We don't work with raw daily numbers because they tend to go up and down. And uh, as against our prediction of fifth to seventh for the peak of the seven day moving average, they actually peaked on uh, May the 8th. And the peak value was close to four lakhs. Now it is very, it's below two lakhs actually. So we think that by the end of uh, June or the first week of July, the number should be in the tens of thousands, 20, 25,000, 30,000, something along those lines. Now, beyond that point, I know your viewers would be very interested in the so-called third wave. So if you want to know whether India is going to have a third wave, what we need to be able to do is to figure out whether the people who are now asymptomatic and therefore have some immunity from the pandemic. How long will they remain immune? What is the rate at which they lose their antibodies? Therefore, when do they become susceptible again? And equally important, as the currently immune people lose their antibodies, can that be compensated by vaccination at a sufficiently rapid rate? And if the answer is yes, meaning that we can ramp up the vaccination so that we can not only compensate for, but uh, even overcome the waning of the immunity, then we should see only a very slight increase in cases somewhere around the end of uh, 2021 or early 2022. On the other hand, if the pace of vaccinations does not pick up, the bump could be a little bit higher. So I'll just conclude by saying one last thing. What we plan to do in the next coming months is to keep monitoring the situation very closely and to run our model as fresh data comes in on the waning of the immunities and on the rate at which people are getting vaccinated.
Okay, so from what you are saying, Professor, the third wave is unlikely to be as extreme as we did see with the second wave, keeping all those factors in mind, am I correct? Well, yes, you can say that, uh, but that is subject to a couple of caveats, uh, in fact, several caveats. First one, of course, is that the pace of vaccination has to pick up from what it is now. Because whoever has some immunities now from having been asymptomatically infected, they will lose them over time. It takes about six to eight months. Second point is that unlike in, in the second wave, which was to a very large extent precipitated by people disregarding the COVID compliant norms, we have to assume that people are, have learned their lesson and will continue to obey the COVID compliance guidelines, even as the cases are showing a noticeable downturn. And the third caveat is that there is not the emergence of yet one other variant, which is still more infectious than what we have seen now. Uh, if I can summarize the second wave in uh, one sentence, I would say that the emergence of the more uh, virulent sec uh, variant which is now called Delta, previously called B1.617, that increased the rate of transmission of the disease by about 20, 30%. And the fact that people freely abandoned any semblance of complying with COVID guidelines, that also increased the transmission rate of the disease by about 20, 30%. So cumulatively, it caused the disease to be spread at about 60% faster rate than earlier. So that's what caused the second wave to be so much steeper than the first wave. Now, we could have coped far better with either one of the factors. I, that is, either the emergence of a more infectious variant or people being careless. But the two together are what precipitated the, the spike. So uh, just to repeat what I said earlier, if people are a little bit more mindful of the COVID guidelines, we should be able to keep the third wave um, within manageable limit if it occurs at all. And if the vaccination pace picks up, then I think that we can be much more sure of containing a potential third wave. Professor, hi, morning. I just want to understand from you as to whether or not you've read into these stringent measures being taken. Uh, uh, in terms of lockdown, is that, you think, the way to go in order to curb the cases? Of course, initially, it perhaps was inevitable, but these extended lockdowns at a time like this, is there not a fear that as things gradually open up and, you know, people resume their lives normally, that yet again we are likely to see a pickup? And do you think also that in order to keep the, cur the cases at bay, that perhaps periodic lockdowns are, are the need of the hour? No, definitely extended or prolonged lockdowns are definitely not the need of the hour. Uh, lockdowns cause enormous damage to society. Uh, the more visible ones are the reduction in economic activity, but there are also other invisible damages. For example, schools being shut for months and months on end, the poorer segments of society being deprived of regular inf uh, incomes with the end result that children get malnourished and have uh, stunted growth. So all of these are costs that cannot be borne for a very long period of time. Uh, one month, six weeks, that's sort of okay. And even there, we have some work coming out. We are just putting the finishing touches on this paper, which we plan to submit for publication. Uh, what we are doing is to compare the impact of different uh, lockdown models that the various states have um, imposed to see which form of lockdown seems to work the best in terms of bringing down the rate of transmission of the pandemic. And our conclusion is that a very gentle type of lockdown where normal activity more or less goes on and only congregation of crowds is uh, prohibited and enforced by the authorities, that works far better than the kind of a total lockdown that we have seen in some states where all economic activity is squeezed into just a few hours. Now, if you just think about it, it's not not hard to see why this total lockdown doesn't work because 
the whole point about uh, uh, preventing the spread of pandemics has to be on reducing the rate of contact between people. But if you force everybody to do their shopping in a two-hour window or a three-hour window, in fact, you're actually going to increase the rate of contact between people. Whereas if you allow normal life to go on but prevent the gathering of crowds, then uh, that is actually a much more effective way of uh, containing the spread of the disease. And I would also say, as you have correctly pointed out, it is sustainable over a long period of time. You can have a gentle lockdown for several months. You cannot have a total lockdown for months and months. It just simply is not going to be feasible. Right, point taken as of now. We are seeing some restrictions being eased, but by and large, the lockdowns across states have continued. Um, you know, you've spoken about strong measures being taken in order to prevent a third wave. Um, what strong measures is it that you would believe need to be implemented uh, at the local level in states and districts and cities? I don't really think I spoke about strong measures to prevent the third wave. Actually, what I said was that if we can ramp up the wave, uh, the rate of vaccination to counteract the rate at which people lose their natural immunity, those who are currently infected, then that by itself should go a long way in preventing a third wave. And the measures that I would like to see uh, to see that the third wave is not very substantial is not, repeat, not strong measures like total clampdown on all economic activities. I don't believe in that. What I would actually like to see is a very gentle form of a lockdown where normal economic activity is allowed to go on, perhaps night curfews so that uh, uh, things like bars and restaurants can be kept closed, but uh, people can go around for day-to-day -day shopping and things of this nature. Uh, and at the same time, no large congregations of any kind. I don't think that's a very strong measure. And in my opinion, that should be more than sufficient to uh, prevent the emergence of a massive third wave, especially if we can ramp up the pace of vaccination. Yes, Sagar, such a great pleasure to have you on the show today and getting all that insight from you. Thank you so much for taking the time out. Thank you. Thank you very much.